a small, small child has been starved to death, apparently. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. It's so good to see you this morning. Amen. Crazy day we got ahead of. I got up this morning and I went to go see what the temperature was outside. If I was going to freeze to death or burn up. You know, in Tennessee, we never know. Last week it was 70 degrees. The, what, two days after we had snow? We had almost six inches of snow in Rogersville. and about the same here in Russellville. And I'm like, what is going on? And then Monday you got to bring out the sunblock, you know. Glory to God. Welcome to Tennessee. Anybody visiting Tennessee for the first time? Good. You're used to it then. Amen. But I thank the Lord. He's good to us, and it's going to be okay. There, there is a, 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 a ban on burning today, okay, except in-house. You can, you, we're going we're gonna to burn for the Lord from our hearts. Amen. We're going to have holy heart burn. Amen. But there is a, a burn ban. Believe it or not, in Highly humid Tennessee, it's going to drop down to 20 to 30 percent of humidity today. You that have been suffering with nose drippings, <laughs> rejoice. God has sent relief your way. You'll be drier than the Sahara Desert. Hallelujah. But it'll be all right. It'll be all right. I want our ushers to come on if they would right now. Just grab whoever's not paying attention. It'll be good. Amen. We want to glorify the Lord because of his goodness to us and how he has just been, he has, he's been so good to us. We praise the Lord. You know, when I begin to think certain things, I, I got to give praise to the Lord. Brother David West is in the hospital and had to have emergency surgery yesterday on a situation that he didn't even know he was having. And then last night it seemed like things were not good. And, and I told Sister Nada, I said, hold on, God's not through and this morning praise God things are turning around for him he's doing much better he's hungry how many of you know if a man's hungry he's okay when they're not hungry that's when you get concerned are you hungry honey no oh what's wrong <laughs> you know so they go yes I'm starving to death oh they're well and healthy and whole so he's getting hungry and it's going to be all right. And I want to encourage Sister Nada, and I did encourage Sister Nada to just trust God. Can I, can I go on record and tell you, whatever comes your way, trust God. Jesus cursed a fig tree because it revealed it should have had figs, but it had none. I want to go on record and tell you, God does not raise up, raise up shade trees in his vineyard. He raises up fruit trees. And if you think God's going to be pleased with your leafy greens, some of you that are vegans are going to have trouble with this next statement. Amen. He's looking for fruit. And the Bible said he cursed that fig tree. And 24 hours later, they walked by the same tree. And the Bible said it was dead from the roots up. And Peter saw him. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> the tree. And you know what Jesus said? You know, the things we don't, here's, here's, here's something for you. On the things we don't understand, on the things that blow our mind spiritually, mentally, physically, otherwise, the things that blow our mind, Jesus got four words for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. I want to make sure three of you are ready. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Have faith in God. Check it out. I didn't come up with that. Jesus did. And he didn't come up with it. It is a solid rock answer. When things happen in your life, when things happen in your family, when things happen, how many of you know things happen? Amen. Have faith in God. Whew. I feel like preaching now, but I better pray for just a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you to receive tithe and offering, O oh God. Your word is declared to us to bring it into the house. Bring it all into the house. So, Father, we do that, God, Lord, not to please somebody in a faraway city or land, but, Father God, we do it because we want to honor you. And you've promised us that when we do that, Father God, when we bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse, that, Father God, you'll pour out a blessing that we cannot even begin to contain. 
I'm asking you in Jesus' name, God, Lord, get our minds off of just the monetary. Help us to see the things that money can't buy. Peace and joy and happiness. Contentment, Father God, Lord, with you and in life. And I pray, God, so much more that comes our way. Touch right now every hand that's about to give. Bless them for what they're about to do. Father God, Lord, cause it to come back to them according to their faith in you and their promise in your holy word. And Father, be honored in what we say and do today through our giving as we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For it's in Christ's name we pray right now. Amen and amen and amen. Bless you as you give unto the Lord today. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, why don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. You just never know what's going to happen around here sometimes. I know I don't. This was given to me on Wednesday night, which I was grateful for. Being Irish isn't enough for some people who insist on pinching you if they don't see green. I kept thinking if they pinch me anymore, I'm going to see red. But my good friend Kenny felt sorry for me, and prophetically sent me green to wear that night. Everybody wanted it. In fact, one sister, who will go nameless Sister Diane Ackerman, <laughs> borrowed this. And she said, I'll bring it back, I promise. You didn't have to. You really didn't have to. And I thought about wearing this for Kenny's sake, and I thought, man, that'll drive people nuts on the live stream, so I better not do that, but uh, thank you so much, Brother Kenny, amen. And we're going to work on something with Ann, right? Not now, not, don't she's like, not now, no, we're going to work, I said we're going to work on it, we're going to work on it, give her an opportunity, she, she plays the piccolo, amen. Oh, the flute, I was told the piccolo. Well, I'm a preacherist, and I'm going to preach. Hallelujah, one way or the other. But at any point, I won't tell you who, Gary, told me that it was a piccolo. But the flute's cool. Flutes are cool. She can do some Jethro Tull for us. Some of you have no clue who Jethro Tull is. Was he on the Beverly Hillbillies? Get it? Hallelujah. Oh, my gosh. I better dig myself out of this hole. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans, chapter 12. I, I, I just feel like I need to go ahead and get into the Word. You probably are past that feeling. I, I said something this past week. I think it was last Sunday, talking about the gifts of God. And, again, forgive me. I, I, I'm not trying to say that you don't have this understanding but the things that I think everybody knows, everybody don't know. The things that I know. And so part of the deal is being a pastor and as a minister of the Word of God is to share the things that I know. 
Because I've learned over the course of 40 some odd years now in preaching that just because I know it doesn't mean everybody else, I don't know everything. I know a whole lot more now, 40 something years later than I did before. But I think it's incumbent upon me to share because my knowledge may not be part of your knowledge. And what I share with you, you know, you have the right to reject it. I promise you I will never share anything that, that's, that's not good for you. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. I like something I heard somebody say. If the preacher preaches something against something that you're doing, don't get mad at the preacher. Find out why he shared it. Not because he was trying to bring you down, but because he cares enough for your soul. You know, if we had more preachers more concerned about people's souls than about their pocketbooks. If we had more preachers concerned about their souls and their life and their living than they were about whether or not that they were going to bless the pastor. You know, I, 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 we watched something yesterday, and I, I won't go into details, but uh, it was a video of one of the last, the last message that I preached at a church that I left, and I had forgotten all about it. And the Lord helped me to help the church before I left. But the very things that I warned them about came upon them because they, well, he's just ranting. Let him go on. No. Can you imagine somebody thinking about Moses that way? When he's up there sharing what he shared from thus says the Lord God of hosts. How about Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount that people say, oh, it's just, it's just that crazy Galilean. You know, he's spouting off again. He's ranting. He, he's, he, he's absolutely just, you know, emptying out all this pent-up frustration. No. The concern that I have is in a world that we're living in, and we live in a strange world, where a man who starts a war for nothing more than a war's sake dares to quote Jesus Christ to his armed forces to encourage them to fight on. Mr. Putin is losing. On so many levels, it's not even funny. But he dared to quote Jesus Christ. He dared to quote the Word of God. No greater love has anyone than this, that they lay down their life or their soul, is the way he said it in Russian, for their friends. Keep fighting, brave, strong Russian army. Mr. Putin, I know you're watching. You need to take your toys and go home. I'm not saying that Ukraine is totally innocent. I'm not going to get into that argument. I will say this. What he's doing is wrong and can never be justified. He didn't fight against airstrips as far as military was concerned or against uh, army bases. Well, he's bombing homes and apartment complexes and hospitals. Are you hearing me? Schools. And places like that that only have civilians in. Somebody tried to liken him to being Hitler. Well, I don't know all that Hitler did. What I did here was that he took out the, the retaliation forces in Czechoslovakia and Poland as he did his blitzkriegs across East Germany or East, East Europe, rather. And I can tell you this much, folks. There'll never be a justification for dropping a bomb on innocent people. Even if America does it. Don't get quiet on me now. So in my endeavor to share with you what I know, I mention gifts. You all love gifts. Gifts are cool. Especially if they're ours. That we're given. I don't know about you all, but there are times I do my best to try to keep up with all the birthdays, all the anniversaries, Christmas anniversaries and so on and so forth and there are sometimes he just sneaks up the one smart thing this pastor's done is I've never let the anniversary between me and her slip up I ain't stupid I gotta live with her you just get to visit with her Romans chapter 12 the apostle Paul shares about the first of three sets of gifts that I want to share with you. Look at what chapter 12 and verse 3 says, if you would. For I say, through the grace given to me. Paul says, I can't say it unless the grace was given. So I've been given the grace to speak this. He says, 
to everyone who is among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. My fingers do not operate like my ears. My belly does not operate like my brain, although sometimes I think they get together. Body parts have different functions. And those functions all work together. And when one body part is messed up, is sick, or diseased, the whole body can become affected, if not even infected. He said, so we, talking about us, being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Did you hear that? We've all got gifts. We look at some people and we smile and we go, they're gifted. And we mean that as a put down or a judgment of their physical or mental stability. But the fact of the matter is, folks, we are all gifted. And Paul makes it very clear, let us use these gifts. I'm coming back to that. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If it's ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches, let him use it in teaching. He who exhorts, use it in exhortation. He who gives, do so with liberality. He who leads, do so with diligence. He who shows mercy, let it be with cheerfulness. I'm going to elaborate on these in just a moment. But I want to share with you this morning about being gifted by the grace of God. Gifted by God's grace. Because, honey, without Him, we got nothing. Somebody say amen. amen. Without God in our lives, and I'm going to shock you with an understanding here of these gifts. Father, in Christ's name, help us. Open up our minds and our hearts, God. Help us to gain understanding. Don't let us see with our eyes, God, and not be able to see at all. Don't let us hear, God, with our ears, but not hear with understanding. Don't let our hearts, God, be shut off, turned off, shut up, shut down, God, Lord, to receiving understanding. But help us, God, to receive it today for our own benefit as well as the benefit, especially of those around about us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. When you hear the word gift, you know, you probably think of a box with a ribbon wrapped around it and a big bow on the top of it and things like that. And you're not far off because that is a good, that is a good visual aid of what a gift is. But by definition, the word gift is this a thing given willingly to someone without payment. A present. A presented present. Second of all, it is a natural ability or talent. The, the, the definition that I got here gave me an example. That example is he has a gift for comedy, unlike me. Amen. Don't laugh too much. It'll be all right. So a gift then is something that's given willingly by someone, to someone, without any kind of payment or even a promise of repayment. You know how we do. We get a Christmas gift for somebody and we realize that our gift costs so much less than theirs. So we go out and try to buy something else to add to that gift to, you know, beat them. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy how we just can't accept a gift? I'm the world's worst. I confess it. I admit it. Somebody pays me a compliment. I'm like, uh, 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 uh. oh, he's gifted. Am I telling the truth? She's nodding her head. For those of you who can't see her. Somebody gives me a compliment. I, I just cannot accept it and say, pray. I've gotten a place where I say this more. Well, praise the Lord. Because he gave it to me. Therefore, I've given it out. Amen. I believe if God's going to pour something into you, he didn't pour it into you for you to put a lid on it and stick it away someplace. I believe God gave it to you to what he pours in. He expects you to pour out. 
Doesn't matter whether it's singing, preaching, teaching, playing an instrument, whatever the case may be. If God pours it in you, let it be poured out of you. You're just a pitcher. And you're not supposed to necessarily be a relief pitcher. With that understanding in mind about what a gift is, I want us to look at the gifts that God has given to us. When I speak about these gifts, I want to share with you these gifts are available to us as believers with one possible exception, and that's what I just got through reading to you from the book of Romans chapter 12. I say that very simply put because I want you to understand the gifts. When you take a look at gifts in general and you find out that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has given us gifts. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 verse 6, 7, and 8 what we're going to talk about primarily this morning is that God the Father has given us gifts that are revealed in our natural lives. Second of all, there are gifts that God the Son has given to the church. By going through that, that great universal calling of everybody to salvation, He chooses from amongst us those who are to lead in the church, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Then when you take a look at the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit significantly has, been giving, has given us nine different gifts that are available to the believer. I want to go on record and say again that the gifts that are mentioned there in 1 Corinthians 12 are not gifts to the world. They are gifts to the church given to individuals so that individually they may be utilized by God to let those gifts be poured out and thereby bringing us all together. We are all beneficiaries of those gifts. I have a will. It means nothing to you. I didn't leave you anything. But I did leave her something. And I left my boy something. Hello, are you hearing what I'm saying? Some things aren't meant for everybody. Some things are meant for certain people exclusively. And the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit that he gives, according to 1 Corinthians 12, is not for the world. It's for the believers. And the believers aren't supposed to go around and say, Well, bless God, this is my gift. It's my ministry. Baloney. And the Hebrew is salami. You need to understand God didn't give you a gift for it to be yours exclusively. He chooses whom he individually wills to have those gifts. And he uses those gifts through the yielded vessel to the best of the ability, which God's ability is without limit. But even more importantly, as we yield ourselves to God and surrender ourselves, he is able to utilize that gift much greater than if we try to box it up and put a bow on it. Amen. Let's look at this. First of all, if you don't catch anything else about this, catch this. These gifts are given by God's grace. 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 That beautiful word that is still misunderstood today. Grace. Grace, by definition, is the unmerited or un earned favor of God that bestows blessings upon anybody hello he makes it to rain on the who and wait a minute now just wait one cotton pick a minute if I'm living for God how come sinners get the benefit of rain well you know so they can go out on a boat on Sundays instead of being in God's house God causes certain things to come in everybody's life, whether you're living for him or not. This is the grace of God. You can never earn that favor. You can never earn that blessing. And God giving that blessing out to whoever he chooses to, for you to understand this, I want you to grasp that you or I don't do anything to deserve the blessing. There's no point to anything in the trappings of our flesh to get it. We can't say, well, you know, I'm fourth generation church of God, therefore I'm going to get this. Oh, you're going to get it, all right. I, you say, well, but people don't do that. Yeah, yeah, they do. In fact, I found out the closer you get to Chattanooga and Cleveland, it gets worse. My great-great-grandfather started this church. Seriously? Seriously? I've had people want me to be impressed because they were related to this brother or that brother or this sister or that sister. 
I got news for you. I'm more impressed by the fact that you honor Jesus Christ than I am honoring the memory of your grandparents. I love my grandparents. And if I got to know your grandparents, I would have loved them too. But friend, let me tell you, their honor and what's due them it pales in comparison to what God is owed because I owe him so very much because of my life, of my life, with my life, for my life. We can't do anything. You can't give so much that God will go, oh, I will bless you. No. It doesn't work that way. Grace is given by God to anybody he wants to. Anybody. We can't handle that. If God decided to bless Putin for whatever reason, some of us would have an absolute coronary on the spot. But the truth of the matter is God can bless whoever God wants to bless. God can do for anybody whom God wants to do something for. And whether you like it or not, look what God did for you. Bunch of people going around beating their chest. I thank God I'm not like that Pharisee. I'm so glad I'm not like that Tax collector, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Paul said, and such were some of you. I got nothing to point back to. I keep going back far enough. I keep thinking I'll find that one family member that was pure, like the driven snow, no spots in it, no, no, no muddy places. I keep going back and man, did they need Jesus. And here I am generations later. Who do I think that I am coming from that mess that I think I'm so much better than them? Romans 12 and 6. God, according to his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Some of you here excel at things that the pastor does not. That was a good place, unless you're sitting there going. You know, you're doing a mental check and see what it is that you do better than the pastor. I promise you there are people here that do things far, far better than the pastor could. And I keep trying to convince Caleb he needs to bring his guitar and take my place. Caleb's like, I don't think I want to do that. Please. Roger won't know what to do with a guitar player that really knows what he's doing. He might play better too. I don't know how that's possible, but it's, you know. So when I begin to look at these gifts found in verses 6, 7, and 8, I begin to see some things. I find seven different gifts that God has given to us. God has given to us. And here's the thing that really gets me about these gifts. God gave us these gifts, not when we came to vacation Bible school, not when we came to a revival, not because we got saved during a service. God, are you ready for this? God put some of these gifts in you from the day you were born. God has supernaturally gifted you with these because of his grace. You just a baby going, hey, hey, it's, it's bright and it's cold and I want to go back where it was warm and dark. That's why we love sleeping in. Pull the covers back over our head and stay in the warmth and the darkness. But God has done something that will be revealed in your life, in your character, in your nature as you go through life. Or you can cover it up. You can ignore it. You can reject it. Let's look at this. Number one, he talks about prophesying. Or a better word there is proclaiming. You have the ability to share vocally, verbally, orally things. You're just a gifted speaker. Most wives feel that that's them. Good. Only the men are laughing. The women are like, we're going to kill him. The truth of the matter is, there are, let's be honest, there are some people who you had no problem standing up in front of your English class, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. You, you got an A. You got an A+. 
My teacher gave me a B plus. She said, you'd got an A plus if you'd done it with a British accent. Where was that in the notes? Oh, I could have done it. I'd have got up there and said, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ear. I could have got an A+. Plus. If you knew my grades in high school, you would understand how much I needed that A+. Plus. There are those people that have no problem standing up. And I won Sister Nolan's heart over by cheering for the sophomores in high school. She's a senior that year, sitting on the front row, and I'm saying, I'm going, give me an S, S, give me an O, O. And they wanted me to do it because apparently I was the only guy that could spell sophomore. I'm not making this up. Somebody, honest to God, got to the third letter and said, give me an F. I'm like, shut up, sit down. <laughs> Sister Nolan sitting on the front row going, can't somebody shut that loud mouth up? So I guess the big plan was marry him and it'll work. <laughs> Failed. Some people have the second, which is ministry. You say, oh, you mean like, a, no, no, no. The better word there is server or helper. There are some people that just want to do for others. They don't want to lead it. They don't want to come up with it. They don't want to have to figure it. They just want to do you guide me, you direct me, you show me, I'll take care of it. Servers, helpers. Thirdly, are those people who teach or educate. We are blessed with teachers in our church. Now I'm talking about school level, some college level. Where's she at? She's upstairs, isn't she? And the fact of the matter is we need educators because not everybody can teach. Amen. Amen. I love Brother Don. Don. Brother Don says he doesn't think that he does a great job. He's right. He doesn't do a great job. He does an outstandingly great job. I love to hear Brother Don teach because he is able to get the point across. You want to know why? I thought you'd never ask. Because he believes in what he's teaching. Teachers that don't believe in what they're teaching don't need to teach. There are exhorters. People who give encouraging guidance. I think of you, Brother Carol. I'll, I'll pick on others as we go along. But you are a person who gives encouraging guidance in the work that you do. I won't go into details with the people, but I know what you do for a living. Maybe you don't see it that way. But I'm going to tell you, you deal with people who have gone to the extreme and you provide encouraging guidance. Don't do that. Those are usually the first three words that come out of your mouth, right? Don't do that anymore. <laughs> then you take a look and there are people that are givers or sharers. I mean, they give. And I'm not talking just about finding. I'm talking about they give. They give their time. They give their talent as well as their treasure. They share. There are those people who are leaders or directors. Trust me, not everybody is. Oh, everybody wants to be. I'll tell you what I'd do if I was leading this here party. Yeah, it probably wouldn't work very well either. The fact of the matter is, is that it's difficult for us to see that, but you know what I'm talking about. You've seen it on the playground at school when you were younger. There were certain kids that could lead a team. There were certain kids that could lead a particular activity, but not everybody could. You know, some of them, they weren't the wall flower, they were the wall. And even though they were there, you had to put flowers on them. Hallelujah. And then last of all, there are those people who are merciful. Or in other words, they shower kindness upon people. I mean, they can't help themselves. They're kind to everybody. Most of the time, they're the ones that are taken advantage of and hurt when they shouldn't be. Now, with each of these gifts comes a quick description or understanding of their operation. If you've got the ability to prophesy or proclaim or preach, then proclaim the message with as much faith as has been revealed to you. Don't try to preach something you don't know. Don't try to proclaim something. you. Well, I got people trying to tell other people how to get saved and they're not saved themselves. 
Brian Free, anybody know that name? Anybody recognize that name? Great tenor, was the tenor voice of, of a group called Gold City. For you that are in gospel, southern gospel music. Brian Free, I'm, honey, his tenor is without a shadow of a doubt the best I've ever heard in my lifetime. Brian Free sang for over two years. Good Church of God boy. Brought up in vacation Bible school. Brought up in youth camps in Alabama. But the truth of the matter is for two years as a professional tenor with the Southern Gospel Group Gold City Quartet, Brian Free had this kind of knowledge of Jesus but not this kind of knowledge. And he testified to it in a live recording that Gold City did when he finally acknowledged, I finally came to the heart knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can you imagine somebody singing about Jesus and not knowing who he is? Apparently not. You want to know what's even more alarming? Is how many people couldn't tell. Man, he got even quieter. I didn't think it could get quieter, but it just got quieter. All these people for two years who went and supported the Gold City Quartet had no clue that one, at least one of the men on the stage did not know who he was singing about. Ministering, serving, helping. Serve or help others as well as you can. Stop trying to match others and their abilities. This is not a competition to see who can be the better helper, the better server. Do what you can for him. If you can't, one lady got so bent out of shape, I want to go door to door knocking. I want to, I want to, I want to do more for Jesus. And finally the pastor with great godly wisdom said, do you have a phone? She said, yes. He said, call him. I never know if I'm going to get in a hospital or not. I never know if they'll let me in. I can go there and bring all the masks in the world. You know, I can put masks over my eyes as well as my mouth. But the truth of the matter is, some places I just have to depend upon the phone. And it took me some doing to get through on that. But I finally, I got over it. And I let my fingers do the walking. There's an old one for you. And I tell folks, I would love to be there in person, but I never know if they're going to let me in. If they're going to see me as a threat or the people that are in the hospital as a threat to me. So I call because I haven't found a virus yet that could come through the phone line. That's old school. Can't even come without the line through a cell phone. The reality is, folks, is that we've got to do what we can do. And we don't try to compare ourselves with someone else. Well, if you were a real pastor, you wouldn't be afraid. I give you my word, I'm not afraid. The fact of the matter is I'm not trying to compete with anybody else. I gave up trying to do that many, many years ago. Some people are just better at certain things than I am. But by the same token, so am I. I got friends of mine that are in pastoral ministry. They cannot carry a tune in the bucket. Their bucket doesn't have a hole in it. Their bucket doesn't even have a bottom to it. That's how bad they are. You let them sing, oh, sweet mother of pearl. Dogs from three counties over are howling. If you're going to instruct, if you're going to be an instructor, you're going to be an educator, you're going to be a teacher, then do so with the subject that you have to others as well as you can. Don't teach what you don't know. I tried to deal with a bunch of guys at the main prison in Nashville, Tennessee regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have then and still have today the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence thereof. And I tried to teach it to them and I tried to bring it down on as elementary a level as I could. I thought it was a great thing. What I didn't know was there were people in there that were bound to determine, bless God, those things have come and gone with the apostles. And I was like, I got hit with things left and right. And the brethren who were there who supported me said, Brother Nolan, you shouldn't have jumped in there. 
I learned a very valuable lesson. Never teach above what you know. And I didn't know well enough how to share. All I had was experiential knowledge. I believed experiential knowledge was all that was needed. Can I tell you, sometimes experiential is okay. But honey, if you want to drive home the point, you need to get in there and study to show yourself approved a workman of God that does not need to be ashamed. Somebody say amen. If you're going to encourage someone, encourage them for crying out loud. We see this commercial every once in a while on our fire stick TV. People that are having you know, problems mentally. And they go through all these things that people say. You know, I understand what you're going through. No, you don't, not unless you've been through it. I feel for you. What do you feel for me? And they go through all these lists of things that we, and we mean well when we say those things. But the reality is sometimes if we're going to encourage somebody, sometimes the best thing we can do is what my dog used to do. My dog would just come, sit down beside me, and he'd mope with me until I got to feeling better. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just sit with somebody and cry with them if you will. And if you can't cry like that, get you an onion. Tanya's like, this is my pastor. If you're going to give, then share with your giving generously. Or don't do it at all. Remember, there was a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Nobody will know what it is I'm giving. Mm. And, wrong answer. Holy Ghost knew. Peter got bold. Thank God for Peter. He, he would stick his foot in his mouth, clean down into his colon, but every once in a while he would be right spot on with whatever God gave him. And he said to them, you're not lying to men. You're not lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Ghost. You got up and made a big to-do about it that you were going to sell this property and give all the proceeds. And then God blessed you because of what you said and what you got was far greater than what you thought you would get. And so you decided to give what other people thought you got. You follow that? Good, because I ain't repeating that. I think I said it right the first time. But too many times we absolutely give what we think other people are thinking we can do. What we need to do is give what God's blessed us with. That sixth deal about leading or directing, lead and direct seriously and do it responsibly. Don't repeat what you've heard unless you really believe what you've heard. Now, some folks are just blind followers. But being a blind follower is not a good leader. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Being a blind follower, a deaf follower. I'm not talking about physical attributes here. I'm talking about, you know, in the sense of you, you just, okay, let's go ahead and do it. You know. Some people are like that. Like sheep led to the slaughter. Believe what you're going to direct or don't direct. If mercy and kindness is what you do, and there are so many of you here in this house who have this gift. You've had it for the longest time. You take stray cats out of the barn and bring them in your house. Every cat in the neighborhood. Hey, let's go to Paula's. Only one cat got your heart. They all after Paula. Do not let her visit you. The cat will come up missing. But kindness and mercy is something you don't have a problem bestowing upon others. Well, then in that case, do it with gladness. Because some people can't bestow mercy and kindness without showing their Real expression on their face. Hello. I just want to be kind to you. I want to be merciful to you. Move them. They cannot be a greeter. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I'm closing. Your heavenly Father has gifted you. 
whether you know it or not, and I think some of you do, but your Heavenly Father has gifted you with at least one of these gifts. Every one of us have at least one of these gifts. Some of us are blessed because we have more than one of these gifts in our life. You've been doing them since you were old enough to know the difference. I want you to grasp what I'm about to share with you. Because this is true, I don't care what the gift is, spiritual or material, gifts are affected by their use, by their abuse, or by their misuse. Did you catch that? Gifts, whether spiritual, whether physical, material gifts, are effective and their effectiveness is affected by our use, by our abuse, or by our misuse. I love Ronnie. Ronnie's got toys. And Ronnie's got toys that have been abused. He's got some toys that have never been used. He's got some toys that have been misused. Do you know what I really like about Ronnie? It's not so much about the toys. He's over there going, shut up, shut up. What I really love about Ronnie is he has the gift of serving and helping others. See, when, when we begin to have our gifts identified, some of us want to run from Don't run from them. Run to the Father who gave them to you. For you see, there's five things I want you to grasp here about gifts. Number one, God has given us those gifts. I said God. Not you, not your mama, not your grandmama. You may have your grandfather's feet, but God gave you the gifts that have nothing to do with those feet. God gave you the gifts. Second of all, you need to understand that everyone doesn't have the same gifts. That doesn't mean you won't meet somebody else in the church that has the gift like you do. But not everybody has the same gift that you do. And there's a reason for that. God trusted you with it to use it properly. Third of all, you need to realize that once we know who we are and what we do best, we can understand why God gave it to us. You ever ask yourself the question, what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? Find your gift. Find out what gift you're blessed with. You'll be amazed at what it does to people when they learn what their gift is. Fourth of all, you need to dedicate the use of these gifts to God's work and not for your own personal success. It doesn't mean you won't be successful in using them, but if you seek it only for that purpose, you will never appreciate fully. It's called misusing. Fifth of all, you need to use the gift with all your heart and don't hold anything back. If you're going to teach, teach. If you're going to preach, preach. If you're going to give, give, baby, give. If you're going to serve, serve. Don't get in there and be afraid of breaking a sweat. Be like Mr. Howell. Oh, goodness gracious, love it. Let's capture it, shall we? We'll put it in a small bottle and save it for later and show the servants. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. These gifts are not given for the exclusive benefit of the person they were given to. They were given for the purpose of us individually using them to benefit everybody. Come, it'll make me shut up. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. It's rather lengthy, but listen to this. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. A sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. In other words, as we come together in the same mind, the same thinking, 
The same conviction. The sphere of our influence enlarges. Listen. So that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. For he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. God gave you the gift. Not for you to get attaboys and accolades, but gave it to you to utilize for the helping of building up his kingdom. There's a commercial out there. You've probably seen it. What's in your wallet? Well, let me ask you, what's in your wallet of life. Do you know how gifted you are? Do you realize how much God loved you and gave to you something special? Something beautiful. Something good. All my confusion He understood. All I had to offer Him was brokenness and strife, but He made something, something beautiful of my life. You know that one? Sing it with me. Something beautiful, something good. Oh, my confusion, and there's a lot in my case. He understood all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something. <laughs> I said, He made something. Thank God. He made something beautiful of our lives. Father, in Jesus' name, there are people here, God, that I truly sensed in my spirit, God, came to the realization they've been blessed. They've been blessed with a particular gift, and until now, they didn't fully realize now, God, Lord, that the realization has hit them, helped them. Now that the re realization has become full turnaround for them, help them. So that the gift that they've been gifted with, while maybe not acknowledged or understood by them, now God can be put into full force by them for your kingdom. Help them in the name of Jesus Christ. To operate, God, within the scope, the vision, and the power of the giftedness that you've given to them, I pray. And Lord, we'll trust you with that and believe you for it. Because it's in Christ's holy name we pray. You say, preacher, am I gifted? Oh, I dare say there's not many I couldn't go around and probably share with you what your gift is. Right, there's some of you I don't really know well. But that don't mean I can't get to know you. To share what your gift is. Let me tell you, to know how God has gifted you, man, it makes the path clearer, more understandable, more usable in our lives. But I'm too old to do anything. No, you're not. Well, I'm too young to do it. No, you're not. Babies get used by God just for being babies. But when you turn 30, stop being a baby. Somebody say amen. See, God can use you. Whoever you are, if you'll just, I surrender. Man, there's so much in me, but i got to shut up because y'all got to go. You see it in your eyes. You're thinking, I'm going to have to contend with the Methodist now for my place at the restaurant. It'll be okay.
good to have Ann and Ray with us. And what's the little one's name? Cricket. She named him after him? Her. Cricket, okay. You had nothing to do with it. Named a small dog child after a cell phone. Hey, we love you. I don't know if y'all know that. I love y'all so much. I'm so glad to see you here today. And I'm so glad that God brought you here today. Please make sure that our visitors feel welcome. Let them know how much you love you, how much you love them. And then, if I could get the gift of speech, oh, hallelujah. And then, just be friendly to one another. Until tonight, 6 o'clock, bless you, bless you, bless you is my prayer. Amen.